My name is Mike Berry. I'm a lecturer at Cardiff University. Um, my area of research really looks at how media influences public understanding, a variety of kind of um, economic, social, political issues. Um, and as I say, I'm going to talk today about what we could do to democratise the media. And I thought I might talk for kind of around about 30 minutes and then we can throw it open for discussion and you can fire questions at me or we can kind of debate amongst each other. Um, so the structure of the, the talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how our current media system is set up. So in terms of um, press, broadcasting and the internet, uh, how it's structured, how it's regulated and some of the consequences that stem from that. Um, and then in the second half, we'll talk about what could be done to make those particular parts of the media more democratically accountable and more open to a wider range of, of people and perspectives. Okay. So, first of all, I want to talk about the press in this country, and I'm sure people in the audience here have some very strong opinions about the press and the nature of how it's set up and some of the problems that stem from that. Um, one of the first issues that you note when you look at the structure of the press in Britain is that it's obviously very, very concentrated. So just three companies, uh, Reach, News UK, which you probably would know better as News International, and DMG uh, Media dominate about 90% of the national uh, press. Um, they, along with the BBC, are also the kind of key news brands that are shared and discussed on social media as well. Um, similar story at the local level, where um, in 2021, about 83% of local newspapers were controlled by five media groups. Now, this particular concentration of, of media is, is, is obviously a problem. One of the key problems that it creates is, is a lack of plurality. Now, plurality is important because as citizens, um, we need to hear the widest range of, of, of voices and perspectives um, if we're able, if we want to be able to function effectively with a, within a democracy and to be able to know what our interests are and who best represents them. So having a media that is so highly concentrated um, threatens the plurality of the voices and the range of perspectives that we're actually exposed to. Media as well, we also expect to fulfill what are sometimes described as the kind of classic um, fourth estate functions or the watchdog functions, i.e. being able to kind of keep an eye on the powerful and bring to public attention, you know, corruption or, or abuses of power. Um, but unfortunately, the way the newspaper industry is set up is it's not really set up to report within the public interest. Um, we've seen that in a number of cases, um, most obviously uh, the hacking scandal where the widespread corruption and e illegality of, of certain parts of the newspaper industry were not even reported on for a very, very long period of time except by The Guardian. It was the only newspaper for a long period of time which even um, was, was, was breaking, the great re investigative reporter Nick Davis breaking and, and, and filling out all the details of that, the, the widespread hacking and the criminality that was actually going on in the newspaper industry. Okay. We could also look at other examples of where the, the newspaper industry doesn't report in the public interest and actually reports you know, in ways that are completely against it. For instance, um, it was reported um, a few months ago that Rupert Murdoch um, had an audience with uh, Boris Johnson and, and while he was bouncing Boris Johnson's new son on his knee, he was telling Boris Johnson that he needed to abolish um, the BBC. Um, we can also think of um, examples, for instance, that came out in the Levinson inquiry where, where, where members of News International w reportedly threatened to go after our own elected politicians if they did things that potentially damaged the market share and profitability of News International. So in many ways we can see in which parts of the news industry don't really operate in the public interest. There are their own power source. 
They, they operate in concert with other power sources, such as elected politicians, um, and often they, 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 are, they are pushing a particular agenda which is very much against the public interest. When we look into the nature of reporting itself, um, we see that newspapers are, pri or, or some newspapers are primarily drawn towards the agendas of their owners. Um, the most obvious example would be Rupert Murdoch, and, and Rupert Murdoch famously doesn't um, appoint yes men to key positions within his organization. He likes to appoint people who he sees as true believers in his own particular political philosophy. And of course, that's a political philosophy that's very, very anti-trade union. It's very supportive of a, of a small state and low taxation. It's very pro-corporate. It's very anti-environmental. And it's often suffused with climate change skepticism um, through Rupert Murdoch's papers. Um, and we see those particular problems uh, in even greater um, clarity at, a, at, at the Telegraph Group. Um, which is running a kind of a long-running campaign against the environmental movement, which has now been uh, sort of subsumed into kind of broader cultural war issues where there are kind of daily attacks on, on things like veganism, on uh, cycling, um, on electric cars, on climate change, on the whole gamut of things um, associated with environmentalism. So a lot of problems in, 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 the, in the press particularly. When we look at broadcasting, um, we've seen over the last few decades that the BBC has um, increase, uh, increasingly moved away from public service broadcasting to uh, priorities that are more set by the market. Uh, we saw this, for instance, sort of beginning really around 1991 with the introduction of the Broadcasting Act, which... Um, brought into um, being a number of kind of pro-market mechanisms within the BBC. So you had producer choice, the fact that BBC had to commission out a lot of its um, content to in independent producers, the creation of an internal market, and, and slowly turning the BBC from an organisation that was much more squarely devoted to the public interest to something that was much more concerned with, with profitability and being subsumed into the market. Now, the, the consequence of that, and we've seen that in public um, broadcast uh, organizations around the world, is what that tends to do is you tend to reduce the degree of hard news, of investigative news, and you, you lead to the creation of more consumerist and softer focused um, material. So you, you get away from that kind of hard-hitting investigative stuff and you inevitably produce things that are much more um, concerned with people as consumers rather than citizens. Um, now, I don't want to kind of present the, the, you know, an idea that there was ever a kind of you know, a golden age of public broadcasting where everything was great and there weren't any problems because we know from research conducted over many decades that the BBC tends to be relatively s s socially liberal on, on uh, kind of social issues, but it does tend to be right of centre on the economy and it also tends to support relatively establishment positions and it also tends to be relatively supportive of the government of the day. Um, we can see this, for instance, um, in a number of areas. Um, I'm sure a lot of you remember the 2008 financial crisis where all the banks nearly went bust. Um, I wrote a book about that. And one of the, the key things that you noticed from writing the book was um, not just in the newspapers, but across the whole of the media, both in uh, the, 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 the right of centre press, the left of centre press and the BBC, you saw a very, very r narrow range of perspectives about what would happen after the financial crisis. So there was very, very little talk in those or um, uh, across the media um, advocating for instance you know much stronger control of the banking system and, and possible nationalization and when it came with how to deal with the the kind of consequences of the, as of the crisis for instance the rise in the deficit what you got was a almost a complete consensus across all the media, not just in the press, but also in the BBC, that we had to have austerity and that we had to have you know, very, very severe cuts to public spending. There were other things that could have been done 
Um, the deficit would naturally close as the economic cycle moved from recession um, into growth. Um, and, you know, if we had to close the deficit, then it should have been done on the shoulders, some people would have argued, of people who were more able to bear it rather than just slashing public services, which we know from research has had an incredibly negative impact and has led to probably hundreds of thousands of avoidable deaths. Um, and, and misery for a lot of people. So we saw from, from that example how often at, at points of crisis, organisations such as the BBC um, will, will often kind of coalesce around um, what we might think of as, as, as sometimes quite right-wing positions, particularly on the economy, um, and, uh, and positions that are also relatively uncritical of government. Another interesting example um, where research has been done recently was over the COVID pandemic. And I don't, I don't know if you remember when it originally, um, COVID originally broke, Britain was pretty slow off the mark in actually doing anything about it. Um, the, the government kind of resisted kind of locking down um, for quite a long time and bringing in measures that would have um, actually um, stopped the pandemic pretty much in its tracks um, and also um, saved lives. So the research from the epidemiologists said that if we'd brought in... Um, you know, restrictions a week or two earlier, we probably could have saved 50 or 60,000 lives in the original, um, um, in, in, at the original breakout in the, the earliest phase of the pandemic in, in March 2020. Now, when I looked at the BBC reporting in that era, while the WHO were, were, were advocating that everybody go hard and go fast at the epidemic in order to save lives, and, and the government was dragging its heels, um, the BBC largely endorsed the government's position. It, it hardly featured anybody criticising the kind of disastrous herd immunity strategy, and it, it was full of um, uh, kind of commentary saying, you know, we need to be a bit careful. The government's doing the right thing, and and, and we know later on um, in a report, uh, a home. Um, a, um, a parliamentary report, it was described as one of the worst public health disasters in history. Um, yet at the time, the BBC was, 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 was directly endorsing the government's um, kind of disastrous herd immunity approach. Now, why, why do we tend to get a, a, a BBC that looks like that? And I think there's a number of reasons. First, I think the most important reason is the power that the government of the day holds over the BBC. So it can set the board of governors, um, as well as the, the chairman and the director general. It controls the license fee. It also sets the terms for the renewal um, of the charter and does at times threaten to abolish the BBC. So it has a significant levers of power that it can threaten the BBC with, as well as kind of um, making sure that the people who are in overall oversight of the corporation, the board of governors, are kind of packed with its own supporters. Um, other key areas around the BBC are who are the key sources that they're actually referring to. And often it's, it's kind of institutional establishment sources rather than people from, um, you know, pressure groups or, or a wider selection of people from civil society who are featured. Um, you also need to think about where the journalists are drawn from, the kind of class background, the uh, ethnic gender. Are people being drawn from, um, you know, wide diversity um, of groups? And, and often it appears that that's not the case. Um, and also the kind of final point that I think is really important is that the, the BBC is heavily influenced by the agenda set by the newspaper industry in Britain, which tends to lean, as I'm sure you're aware, very much to the right. Okay, so... There's a few thoughts about broadcasting. What about the internet? Now, if we look at that particular part of the media, what we see there is, um, again, there's a, a lot of kind of concentration of ownership. Um, and the, the, the internet, particularly the part of the internet where people get their information from, so I'm thinking primarily here about the, the search engines and the social media companies, uh, there it's particularly highly concentrated with a very, very small number of unaccountable corporations, um, such as uh, obviously Meta, Facebook, Instagram, um, Google, a tiny selection of, of, of corporations who, who really kind of dominate that particular sector. And although these, um, although these giant corporations are incredibly powerful and they're the kind of key information source for large parts of the population, they really don't think about themselves in terms of being content companies. 
Uh, Mark Zuckerberg famously, he, he doesn't think about Facebook as being a, a content company. He thinks as an engineer, and his, his whole focus is on the notion of how do I engineer this particular platform to engage people for as long as possible. Because the whole business model of the tech giants is based on what you may have you may have heard of it, the notion of the attention economy. So the longer they keep you on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, the more money they make because they collect more data and, and you're more valuable to their advertisers. So um, these companies don't really care about what you're sharing or what you're looking at. Um, so they don't care if you're looking at the highest quality information that's out there or whether you're looking at disinformation that's been put out there by bad actors. The algorithms just prioritize um, the kind of information that will hold you on the platform for as long as possible. And that information, <laughs> you probably won't be surprised to know, is... Um, is, is kind of information that makes people both angry and outraged. Those are the ways to hook people in and to keep them in. So the algorithms that the social media companies have created work to, to outrage, to, to annoy people, to get people angry, and that's what's seen to kind of suck people um, in. Okay. Now, of course, um, we know that Autocrats and bad political actors are also aware of this and they know how to game the system um, in order to hook people in um, and, you know, to actually kind of keep you engaged. But this is very obviously very, very um, problematic. If we kind of have a kind of an information ecosystem of which social media is a huge part, which doesn't differentiate between low and high quality information, and is just about kind of generating attention and anger and outrage. And to a certain degree, you know, we could say the popular press works on the same model. Um, you, you create amongst the population, on one level you create polarization because you are creating people who, who see people have a different point of view as being the enemy, you also kind of collapse the notion of kind of shared facts and a kind of consensus. And most of the big kind of collective problems that we need to solve, obviously, like, like climate change or, or like biodiversity or even dealing with future pandemics, are going to need a degree of consensus amongst the population. But when people are being exposed to information sources that, you know, often, you know, it's just garbage information. Um, some, some kind of political campaigners, you know, talk about, they talk about flooding the ecosystem with, with, with shit. It, it then becomes very, very difficult to actually get the consensus and, and get the agreement on what we really need to do about these problems. If people are just filling the information environment with, with, with kind of false information and disinformation on these particular problems. Okay, and obviously at the most extreme level, you 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 have very very bad actors kind of um, weaponizing these particular social media systems to drive things such as um, ethnic hate and even genocide in in places like um, Myanmar. Right? Um, when the internet came out, you often had all of these people who were very very positive, saying, you know, this is going to be great. This is going to this is going to um, you know revolutionise the world, make people more free. All this free flow of information. But of course, some of the first people to use social media and the internet, well, social media um, in the internet initially, and then social media, were far right groups and Islamist groups, and they weren't looking to use it for kind of progressive social ends. Okay, so let's have my doing for time. Talking for about 20 minutes, which is what I wanted to talk about in terms of some of the problems that we actually have. So what could we actually do about some of these? What could we, what could we do to change these? And I want to talk today about some, some suggestions that were put forward by the Media Reform Coalition. Some of you may have heard of this organization, some of you may not. Um, it's an organization of activists um, and academics who have been trying to explore you know, how we could regulate and, and reform these different parts of the media so that they, um, they serve the public interest more fully and also democratize it and pull in a, you know, a wider range of people and voices. Um, some of these suggestions that I'm going to talk about today actually made it into Labour's manifesto in, in 2019, though I suspect that very few of them will actually make it into the next Labour manifesto. Um, 
So let me talk about some of those now. Um, I'm not saying that these are, you know, an exhaustive or, you know, the last word on what we could do about the media. There's some ideas. There's some suggestions. And because they were put in a, in a, in a manifesto, you know, you might argue that they are relatively... It could be a bit more ambitious. They could be, you know, a, a bit more radical. But they're, but they're kind of, I think, an interesting jumping off point, uh, you know, an interesting starting point where we could, you know, work through some of the potential solutions to these issues. Okay, so if we were to think about the press to begin with, and as I said, one of the key problems of that is concentration and a lack of uh, plurality, the dominance of a few voices. Um, one of the key problems about that is how we actually decide on how concentrated the media should actually be. At the moment, the, the tests on media concentration are only take place when mergers take place. If there's a major m merger between different media organisations, then that's subject to a kind of review, and the regulators and the conscious secretary will look at it and they'll decide, should this merger go ahead? Um, but I think there's a couple some problems with this. One is you're only doing it when mergers take place, and often concentration can kind of go on to a lower level in the background in the, in the period between major mergers. And the second is that often people like regulators, and particularly the culture secretary, can be subject to capture by key kind of corporate interests. Um, Obviously, the one we would look at in this country would be News International most, um, most closely, but others, obviously other media corporates will also be looking to influence these people. So one thing that you could actually do is to have Parliament set thresholds uh, based on audience share in relative markets and also take account of cross-market indicators in terms of audience share. Um, Ofcom could regularly monitor these particular um, these particular uh, levels of concentration across market, uh, across different markets, um, and if they felt that a particular player was becoming too dominant in a market or across a number of different markets, what you could do then is bring in extra public interest obligations on that particular player, or else you could even break it up. So insist that particular media um, conglomerates are actually broken up into smaller units. Um, that would obviously prefer be preferable um, in, in some ways because of the fact that you can you can see how when uh, a particular organisation, a particular proprietor like Rupert Murdoch gains such a lot of power, that gives him the power to effectively threaten our own elected representatives. And breaking those conglomerates up would help to reduce that power. Okay, what you should also the Media Reform Coalition suggests do, is also monitor intermediaries, such as Yahoo, Facebook, and Google News, because a lot of people are getting their news from those organizations as well, to make sure that those particular intermediaries are not just feeding back to people the news from a small handful of media organizations, so that they themselves are also um, providing more plurality in terms of the sources that they're sending into your, um, your smartphone. Okay. In terms of the press, in terms of reform and regulation, um, one of the key things that was kind of highlighted in the original Leveson inquiry was the very, very worrying links between politicians, um, the media and the police. Um, we never really got to the bottom of those because some of those inquiries were still subject to um, criminal investigation. Those were kind of kicked into the long grass and we, they said that wouldn't happen until the second part of the Leveson inquiry. But that clearly needs to happen and we need to get to the bottom of these very, very worrying, um, you know, corrupt webs of corruption linking politicians, our, our, our media, and also, very, very worryingly, the police. So that needs to be done. We need to kind of implement the second part of the, of the Levinson Review and, and, and get to the bottom of those webs of corruption and break them up. Um, also, the Media Reform Coalition suggests that, as also suggested by other organisations such as Levinson and the Cairncroft Review of Media, they suggest that legislation should be introduced to support fair and effective independent self-regulation of media. So we need to go beyond the current 
very ineffective system of kind of self-policing of the media to have a more effective um, form of, of self-regulation, which would be much, much tighter, more stringent, um, and also support access to justice for those who have been the, the victims of press abuse. Um, so that's another thing that we can do in terms of the press. Um, Another thing, and this is probably the most radical thing, and I think the thing that will... Would you mind if we waited to the end for questions? Would that be okay? And, I'm, and, I'm, and another thing they're going to talk about, and this is probably the most radical one, I think probably the one you will find most interesting, is that the, uh, the MRC Reflect said that you effectively you needed to create a new funding settlement to support public interest news. And what they recommended was that, um, you know, News, <laughs> news, corporate news, particularly mainstream news, has never been especially focused on kind of investigative news and, and public interest news. If you ever read um, Nick Davis's great book, Flat Earth News, which was written about a decade ago, you'll know that most of the process of news is fairly passive. You know, it involves um, interacting with kind of um, key institutional sources. It involves often journalism, reproducing press releases. Not much of the kind of day-to-day -day news really involves what we might think of as the kind of, um, you know, the Pentagon paper, the, un the uncovering abuses, the, you know, that real deep investigative journalism. That's never really kind of been the kind of dominant form of news, and it's become even less dominant over the last decade as news finds itself in financial crisis, driven by the, the migration of advertising from news organisations to social media companies and to the search engines. So a lot of the revenue is going there. So this has made investigative journalism, which has always struggled to be financed because it's expensive, really, really come under pressure. The same with local journalism, which is just disappearing and is preventing people at a local level being able to scrutinise what's going on in their local communities. So um, what, what the MRC is, 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 has recommended has been the creation of an institute for public interest news. And this particular institute should levy a 2% uh, tax on the revenues of the major um, social media companies, the tech companies, and this would generate a substantial amount of money, um, well over a billion pounds a year. And then this money would be funded, would, sorry, would be funneled by the Institute for Public Interest News, which would be uh, a kind of statutory body which would be set up independent of government, but it would be set up under a remit to prioritise funding news organisations which um, included governance structures that, at one, had signed up to an effective form of independent self-regulation um, and also guaranteed ed uh, uh, and also guaranteed editorial independence from owner influence and were all also um, focused on um, forms of public interest and investigative news. Um, as I say, these will be funded by a levy and then this would help to create uh, a kind of more level playing field in which you would have a kind of bigger, broader ecosystem of, of, of news providers which were much more tied into the uh, the, um, the public interest and investigative journalism, and as I say, wouldn't have to worry so much about kind of uh, the, you know the the commercial priorities, um, and so would be able to um, you know devote all their attention to actually reporting in the public interest. And you so you would create an infrastructure of these kind of smaller news organisations, which would help to uh, compete with the larger um, news organisations. Okay. What they also suggested doing was, as well as, uh, uh, you know, funneling support to these new kind of public interest news organisations. I mean, there are some of these about now. I mean, um, does anybody ever here ever read Byline Times? Okay, so, you know, there are examples of kind of digital native organisations that, that are really trying to, you know, work in the public interest. And the idea would be you would create a bigger ecosystem of these organisations, which you would then... Um, funnel funding too, which wouldn't have to be so reliant on kind of, um, you know, advertising, 
um, and, 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 would, and would be free to report um, in a way that, as I say, met more kind of public interest requirements. Um, they also suggest what we should also look to do is um, change some of the quite draconian legislation that's been brought in in this country which has threatened investigative journalism, particularly amend the investigator, Investigatory Powers Act to strengthen the privacy of journalism um, and to, to, to set as an absolute minimum a requirement that all journalists need to be told if they're being placed under any form um, of state surveillance. Um, and they also suggest we should set up a, a statutory right to privacy for both the public um, and the press. Okay, so that's what we could do about kind of what we might think of about being about the kind of commercial media sector, the press, that kind of digital media. What could we do about broadcasting? Now, one of the things that the Media Reform Coalition stresses is that we need to get away from the market-based approach which has come to uh, dominate how the BBC works or has is, or is certainly pulled the BBC more in that direction. But they said we don't necessarily want to return to an old kind of statist model. Um, instead, we should move towards a more kind of democratically controlled BBC which is under public control and which we all have a say in. Um, as well as being insulated from government control and the pressures of the market, so the need to make profits. Um, so what they've suggested, first of all, I think this is probably the most important thing, is that the government should be stripped of the powers to appoint the Director General, the Chairman and the Board members. They should also lose the power to set the licence fee and to determine the contours of the periodic charter review. And instead, the BBC... Um, board and key executives should be directly um, elected by licence fee payers and BBC staff. So the government is effectively taken out of that whole process and it loses its ability, its leverage over the corporation in order to bend it to its will and to threaten it. Um, they also suggest that the BBC should be put on a permanent statutory footing with an independent non-market regulator um, setting the licence fee um, and periodically um, renewing the remit of the BBC. Um, the, they also suggest that a licence fee could be replaced by a digital licence fee pegged to council tax bans. So how much you paid for your digital licence fee would be determined by the amount of council tax you paid, which would help to make it a little bit more progressive than it is now. Um, Other kind of suggestions for how we could change the uh, BBC? Um, it's very centralised as an organisation. There have been moves to kind of, you know, move it a bit out of London and make it less kind of Lon London-centric. Um, but the, the, the MRC have suggested more radical ideas. One of the things they've suggested is the devolution of production um, and editorial control to the nations and regions. So program making and, and news editorial decisions will be decentralized. Um, and national and regional boards will be set up to manage these, and these national and regional boards would be directly elected by, by license fee payers within the regions um, and the nations. Um, and also partly elected by BBC staff. So both of those particular groups would have a, a stake in saying who were the particular editorial uh, board members who oversaw the kind of commissioning and, and editorial structures within the various different nations and regions. Um, and they also suggest we need to see more diversity at all levels of the BBC. I think the BBC has gone some way in actually addressing this, um, and there have been some kind of, uh, I think, progress made in making the BBC more diverse in terms of kind of its, its ethnic makeup, sexuality, um, also um, I think in, in terms of disability there have been some strides but more could be done in this area. But also um, in terms um, of social class that you know the BBC does tend to be pretty much staffed by people who are kind of white middle class and upper class and more could be done to bring in greater diversity of people from different social classes and occupational identities. Um, 
and also a move away from casualization at the organization. One of the key things you notice looking at how the BBC has changed over the last two or three decades, there's been a move from people being on permanent contracts to increasingly casualizing the staff. And if you come from a, you know, a poorer background or you, you have a disability, you know, that's going to make it more difficult for you to get into the BBC and progress. So you need to end casualization. And finally, the internet, and this is where I'm going to kind of wrap it up in terms of what, what, what could we do to make the, the, inter, the internet more democratic and, and more operating um, within the public interest. Um, well, one of the things they've suggested is the, the MRC have suggested is setting up a, a British digital corporation tasked with developing um, innovative technological solutions and, and open source software for, resor for um, aimed at resourcing public interest journalism. Um, we could also look at more stringent regulation of data collection and usage. Um, obviously, the, there's been EU-level um, legislation in that area, but I mean, I think still more could be done in that area. But another key thing I think that we need to kind of look at, look at in terms of kind of democratisation and our access to high-quality information is transparency, particularly on political campaigning. Um, I imagine you, some of you have heard of the rise in election campaigns of dark ads. Who's, who's heard of dark ads? Anybody heard of dark ads or only one person? Well, what dark ads are was, okay, if, if you think about how political campaigning used to be, um, if, if, a, if a politician wanted to make a claim, do advertising, they made it in a party election broadcast or they put a billboard up or they took out an advert in a newspaper. That was in a sense, quite a good system because we could all see what was being said. It was open to democratic scrutiny, you know, and if somebody had lied in a campaign ad or a particular, you know, billboard was misleading, it could be seen and it could be challenged. There was some opportunity for that to be challenged. But what we've seen increasingly in election campaigns is the rise of what are sometimes called dark ads. So these are forms of micro-targeting where on social media platforms like Facebook or particularly on Facebook, um, advertisers, political, you know, political communicators are able to target a very, very small number of people in individual swing constituencies. They don't, they're not really interested in, in most of the constituencies because a few of them actually change hands. But there are a small number of swing constituencies in our first-past-the-post system that, that flip from Labour to Conservative or or, you know, conservative to Lib Dem. And those are the ones they care about. And in those constituencies, what they want to do is identify small numbers of people who they can advertise to, but they send very, these very, very closely targeted ads to a very, very small number of people. So these ads are invisible to almost the whole population, apart from these very, very small number of people who are being targeted in these marginal constituencies. So these ads can be fake, they can be full of lies, um, you know, and because of the fact they're only going to a very, very small number of, of, of people, they're completely untransparent, so they're not able to be challenged. And of course, the other problem is that, the, the, you know, in the past, if you wanted to put a billboard up in a constituency, you had to work within particular tight spending limits. But because this stuff's going through the internet, um, they're now able to kind of circumvent those particular spending limits and pour huge amounts of money into Facebook advertising in these small constituencies. So, in effect, the, um, the kind of regulation of elections hasn't caught up with the digital age. There's a desperate need to do this because of the fact that people can, you know, political parties can, you know, and we know from the last election there was research done that found a huge amount of these dark ads that were being produced by the Conservative Party actually featured false or misleading information. And if you care about the kind of, you know, the quality of our democracy and our ability to, you know, make rational decisions, you really want to, you know, work very, very hard at making sure that kind of content is heavily regulated. So we need more transparency of political campaigning. Um, and there's a very strong case, I think, to ban paid political advertising, particularly on social media platforms, in election periods. So we would still allow parties, you know, to share material organically and, you know, supporters of those parties to share campaign material. But that would have to be done within campaign spending limits and controls on personal data usage. 
There also should be new rules on buying personal data for campaign purposes, particularly if that data is being shared by the user's own, without the user's own knowledge or consent. Um, and there needs to be definitely um, greater attempts to make political advertising, particularly on social media, more transparent, so by using things like kite marks, so people are actually more aware of who are actually, um, who's actually kind of funding and where these particular political adverts um, are coming from. I'm sure you remember at the last election there was some notorious examples of this, so uh, there were uh, websites set up by the Conservative Party, supposed to be independent fact-checking sites, which, you know, when you looked at the bottom, there was a tiny bit, said, you know, that, that gave it away. This was actually funded by the Conservative Party. So, a huge opportunity for these kind of nefarious practices um, to go on. So, I mean, I think that's probably all I kind of want to say at the moment on that, but let me throw it out to you and see what you think. There's a mic over here. If, uh Oh, hello, Mike. I think your view probably on mainstream media is more rosy than my feeling. <laughs> I would sum it up as it's in a shit state at the moment. Even just, if you want a media to work, you've got to tell the truth, okay? And, uh -huh. and it, democracy and the mainstream media go together. If you're not telling us the truth, how can the people make any sort of judgment? The latest thing is, to say, the Ukraine-Russian war. All the views are pro-Ukrainian, okay? Where, what, whatever side you take, you have to have a neutral stance on a judgment. So, as I say, to, to sum it up on a quick one like this, just bring back uh, RT News, Russia Today. Um, at least it told, whether you agree with the Russian opinion or not, at least you could make your own judgment as to which way you think things are going. You Thank you. You still get it on the internet. Yeah, yeah but it's... Yeah, but the trouble is, as I say, you've got to, you've got to go to a lot of trouble to find it, for starters. You need, if you're going to change people's behaviour or views, then it's got to be something big like the BBC. So their, so their view has to be a neutral view, neutrality. Thank you. Anybody else want to, any other yeah, comments? Yeah, there's a couple more. It's a woman down the front here, and then there's a man here. Just indicate if you want to get in. We've got about five minutes. Um, so I actually work for a media co-op um, called the Bristol Cable. Okay. Um, and yeah. <laughs> the Bristol so. Cable were actually one of the kind of um, organisations that was highlighted by the Media Reform Coalition yes, of as course. Yeah, a, a, yeah, yeah. A, a, as a great example of what we should be trying to yeah, support. Yeah. So I mean, not to plug, but if you ha if you're interested in this sort of thing, <laughs> the Bristol Cable are an example of like a, a co-op. Um, but anyway, that wasn't my question. I, I was interested when you were talking about the self-regulation side and how everyone should be regulated independently. Um, and you mentioned Ofcom, and I was wondering your opinions on Ipso and Impress, um, because obviously they work on, on written journalism more. Um, and I know a lot of big organisations are uh, regulated by Ipso, but Ipso have never even issued a fine, even though they say that they can issue up to a million pound fine. So basically, I'm, I'm asking you, how effective do you think they are? Um, and do we need new forms of independent self-regulation yes and i think that's what the you know the, the media reform coalition were putting f were putting forward you know they were saying effectively that the current systems that we have in press and, and ipso don't work very well i mean you know they're toothless um and you know they don't hold um media i mean you know some of the stuff's ridiculous you know when clarifications are you know if if, if a media organization says something that's untrue or defames somebody you know the defamation appears on the front page, you know, but they can hide the retraction and the apology on some tiny little two-line retraction on page 18 that nobody's seen. So, you know, things like that are completely unacceptable. But, but in terms of what actually needs to change, yeah, the current system is, is clearly not working at all and there needs to be something much, much more robust. Do you have an idea of what you'd like it to look like? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I'm just, for an example, Ipso recently, you must have seen The Sun, um, the Ipso made... Uh, the Sun do a front page apology um, for, for yeah for Meghan Markle I think because uh -huh. they uh, defamed her or, or something to do with discrimination I think it was the first ever um, case of Ipso putting something through as sexism um, even though they've got that in one of their clauses they've never actually previously um, reinforced that but yeah they made them do a front page apology 
Um, and that's one of the first times it's ever happened. But yeah, I'm just wondering from your eyes what you think actually... Well, some of, the, some of the suggestions for actually a more effective system of, of kind of self-regulation include changing the structures of how some of these organisations actually work. So, for instance, the workers at the organisation having more say over some of the editorial lines and the control. I mean, this is obviously one of the major problems you have in... In, in press, you know, you, you get journalists saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm free to say what I want at my particular organisation. Well, see how far you get if you go against the editorial line at that organisation. I mean, when, when colleagues of mine did um, a, a book on, um, on how refugees and migrants were reported, um, one, of their, one of the journalists was, was told, told us that... Um, well, told my colleagues that, you know, he, he was told, go out a monster and asylum seeker, and that's what we want you to do today. And within organisations, journalists don't have the ability to push back from that. And I think that's one of the key things that you do need to institute on that. It can't just be a question of the fact that a proprietor has the ability to, you know, set the, 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 the editorial line um, for... Um, for uh, a paper which, which reaches millions of people every day. And people, people imagine somehow that, because not so many physical copies of newspapers are sold, that, you know, that they're, they're losing their relevance in the world. But if you go onto Facebook, the most uh, popular news sites are places like the BBC and the Mail Online and the Guardian and the Telegraph. Those are still the dominant players. You know, so if, you, if people are tuning into Facebook, they're looking at their news feed, that's what they're seeing. <coughs> Right. Uh, I mean, firstly, um, I, I don't think that like sort of breaking the, the monopolies up into smaller groups will necessarily work. It tends to just fall into the same sort of hands in, 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 in uh, you know, whether they're family members or they're, uh, you know, friends or what have you. The abuse thing, I mean, the reality is that like sort of we're all being abused. If we're all being given like sort of misinformation uh, and you know, bias like sort of uh, information, then we're all being abused. And the reality is, and I don't know how you police it, but until you get a situation where either like sort of uh, on any sort of contentious issue, they have to like sort of put in and find like an, a person from the other side viewing their things, like what you were saying with the sort of Russian Ukraine thing, um, unless you have like sort of a, a strong police network that can issue meaningful fines or or actually demand like sort of uh, um, you know opposite viewpoints being in the papers I don't think you're ever going to get anywhere I understand what you're saying there and obviously I mean this is a difficult thing to police um, in terms of kind of would you want to extend the kind of impartiality and balance requirements that currently exist for broadcasting out into newspapers? That would be very difficult to do. And um, I'm not sure that that would necessarily be a, a good idea. I think you can certainly strengthen um, the degree to which you can hold some of those organizations together for material that is inaccurate and is false. You know, th there are questions around accuracy, and one of the things I was I was actually going to finish today with to make some recommendations, um, you know, for how activists could use the the mass media more effectively. And one of the things I was going to suggest was actually, if you see things that you're unhappy with, I'm talking here primarily about the BBC, but if you see things you're unhappy about and you think are wrong or unbalanced, you should write to the organisation. We we think sometimes our, our voice, you know, we're just one person. Our voice doesn't have much. Um, much weight, much clout. Um, but actually, if, if, if the BBC gets 10 or 20 letters about a particular area of coverage, they do actually look at it. I'm not saying you know, they're going to change their policy overnight or something, but the weight of pressure does, you know, does impact them. I mean, you know, they came under a lot of pressure because of the nature, for instance, of trying to feature climate change denialists or sceptics as to balance. And eventually they did change that. And now, you know, the, the denialists are no longer given the same degree of platform. You still sometimes get them on occasionally, but that's, that's partly come from pressure from people and, and from scientists as well complaining. So, I mean, particularly from the more accountable parts of the media, I think, you know, you would say the BBC is on the more accountable end. If you're unhappy, write in and complain about something.
Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just have a, a, a question. She slightly touches on something that's already been raised, but I, I grew up with a bit of a myth of exceptionalism, I think, around how great our media is in comparison to other countries. And I think sometimes looking at somewhere like Italy, which was 90% controlled by Berlusconi, and actually by a lot of people has said it's been it's pushed Italian politics far more to the right than it would have done and also views towards women and and um, and the overall kind of state of the country so I'd be really interested to hear more about where you think might work better in terms of do we is there anything to go by in terms of this myth of exception do we we must I guess kind of comparatively have a slightly better media ecosystem than other countries um, so I'd be interested to hear a bit more about where where do you think works better than here we've got so many problems I mean completely here with what you're kind of talking about and then kind of as a, a slight second point to that that I'm kind of hearing that potentially with the the kind of the the globe the global mead the global sort of like tech companies that are um more within sort of the production of our news than ever more perhaps the nation is actually maybe less important than it has been so I'd also be interested to hear more about maybe the the direction of um trying to articulate this yeah do you know what I'm trying to say yeah does the, the, the nation state is breaking down is it moving away from the nation state and uh yeah implications of that I guess okay so there's two things first of all kind of how we look compared to other countries um I think in many ways I think the, the BBC does produce still a lot of very high quality journalism it's not perfect by a long way and there's definitely things that could be done to improve it but you know you really wouldn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You'd want to look to kind of build on the strengths and improve it. In terms of other countries, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is what the MRC was suggesting, this notion of, of supporting um, media plurality by giving grants to organisations that report in the public interest. And you'd think of somebody like Byline Times. That's gone on for decades in other parts of Europe. So particularly in some of the Nordic countries, and I think it went on in, in, uh, in the Netherlands as well, they've had that system because they realise our kind of information ecosystem, how we find out about the world and how we, how we work, is just too important, too fundamental to democracy just to be left to market forces. So in those countries, you know, there has been that system and it has to ha helped to create a more kind of plural and, and broader kind of media e ecosystem where you can get access to different points of view, you know, helping community radio, small scale TV and local news, all of these things are, you know, vitally important. <laughs> Um, and in other countries which which perhaps didn't go so far down the kind of you know US UK neoliberal free market line those things were seen as things you would do in this country we, we've gone so far down the road of the free market that you know it, it, it would seem almost as being kind of you know anathema or madness to propose such a thing but I think we really do need to put this on on back on the agenda because um, um, you know, I think it is far too important, our information ecosystem, to be left purely up to the market. Um, certainly, I mean, I th are we better or worse? I mean, I think the BBC is, you know, still has a lot of huge potential a, 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 as, as an institution. And there is, but, but there are certainly places in Europe that you could look at, you could say, that are, are even worse than what we have here. Italy obviously being an example. Um, in terms of how important is the nation state, I still think in terms of information state, the nation state is Im enormously important and, and the kind of media organisations with the, the nation state. I mean, one of the things you noticed about something like the EU was um, the EU never got a proper EU public sphere. There's no real EU newspaper, even within a, a big supranatural organisation like that of countries, it's still really national. And the national is still very, very important, even with, for instance, the rise of the tech giants. Hi, yeah. Um, well, I've just heard your reply on uh, the BBC. Uh, well, personally, I think I'm a bit confused why people are still calling them um, another uh, companies, uh, news agencies. I think they are just uh, pure, they become uh, content creators, entertainers, like TikTok videos. Uh, and uh, some people actually mentioned uh, RT here. Uh, RT is no different to BBC. They're just, uh, again, content creators. They, 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 the uh, investigative journalism, in my personal opinion, is actually dead in the UK. People are saying that, oh, we, we need to make it more balanced, you know, uh, get one opinion, another opinion. But the investigative journalist is about getting opinion, another opinion, and then checking it out themselves. 
and that doesn't happen anymore. BBC is full of uh, different um, uh, journalists who talk about yeah things they no longer know what they're talking about. They're just mediocre journalists. They don't do investigative journalists whatsoever, and I, I don't understand why you're still calling it news agencies. They're just content creators, TikTokers. But my questions to you are, uh, you said that... Um, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question, question, question. Yeah, I've written down, so there's a lot of things. Uh, that you would like to get a 2% two, uh, 2 levy on the companies and take it from the uh, advertisement fund, uh, from the uh, social media. It doesn't need to be from from advertisement fund. Why is it from them? It can well, be taken well, from Well, one of the reasons it, just, it will it, be from them is because they're getting a free lunch off the other news companies. Okay. They make a lot of money off the BBC and all the other media companies, and they don't really pay for that. And there's an argument that they should be contributing to news, and they're very, very wealthy. But you can take it for any other use as well. But the question, the second question I've got is that what would stop this independent fund and the uh, the company you would say want to create uh, not becoming another fo uh, market-focused corporation? And then uh, I also noticed you said about the uh, safeguarding public, um, you know, uh, by limiting political advertisement before the advertisement campaign. We don't do it with uh, any other advertisement, you know, safeguarding people. So why would you want to do it with political one? It's like a bit, yeah, it's like a bit, you know, you can't do that. I mean, I'll, I'll deal with the first question you asked me. You, you, you asked me why it was that, um, you know, wouldn't these, 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 these other kind of maybe sort of grassroots public interest news corporations, what's to stop them becoming just like the problems that we have with the press at the moment and the digital media that we have at the moment? I mean, one reason is that you would set up, as, as, the, um, as the Media Reform Coalition suggested, you would set up a number of, uh, a, a number of things that these number of aspects that these organizations would need to fulfill in, in order to be eligible for public funding. So one of the things would be insulation from uh, between editorial and proprietorial control. The second is you would you would tend to give more you'd more like to get funding if you're a cooperative rather than if you are a for-profit organization. Uh, you would you would try and support nonprofits and um, you know you would try and support organizations which had structures which were more likely to produce independent news. Um, I can't remember the second point you've raised, so We're I'm sorry. We're running out of time, uh, we've got one more question. Okay. So really quick question, really quick response. Yeah, very fast, uh, quick. Um, you mentioned the Media Reform Coalition um, um, and questions around for them to shift and change the BBC and the channel and Channel 4. I looked at their consultation. They've had 200 on the petitions, 200 responses in just one year. So my question is about power and like how do and I know JSO and um, uh, uh, Climate Coalition want this media thing is is the biggest obstruction. So with the change that is happening, the disruption to the BBC and Channel 4, what is the most effective way to actually get the options on the table so it doesn't just become another sort of conservative thing that you know is actually transformative? We just don't want ideas. We want to actually see these ideas actually take place. Right. Um, well, I mean, you know, lobby your elected representatives. You know, I, I know that sounds... Oh, God, I'm going to say something. I know, I know, I understand that. But, you know, um, <laughs> amazingly enough, some of these really quite radical ideas were part of the Labour 2019 manifesto. In fact, pretty much all of them were. You know, and, and compared to what they've done in the past... Yeah, so we know that the Labour Party has changed rather radically since 2019. Um... But, you know, I, I think you just have to kind of, you know, get together with other people um, and kind of lobby for these particular things, you know, argue for them, organise. Um, you know, th there is really no substitute for grassroots organising and lobbying. Can I just finish with one very last point? It's going to be a quick one. It's going to be a really quick one. Um, some people, sometimes you pro probably a lot of you are activists. You're trying to, you know, change things. You're trying to do social change, and you you, you kind of you, know, you flick on LBC or you hear talk radio as you're flicking through your your thing, and you think, oh God, it's full of you know, it's full of bloody idiots, you know, talking nonsense, all of this kind of right wing crap or whatever you're hearing, right? Okay, there are quite a few open spaces that are available for you to try and colonise yourself. Um, you can think of the letter pages of newspapers, but you can also think of phone-in shows. And if I wanted to, you know, to really kind of change the public debate, what I would do is get together with a group of people who shared a similar point of view 
and I would target those phone-in shows and I would get, make sure I had a group of people to phone into those open spaces and to put across my group's point of view. And I would organise that in a highly structured way with a group of people who could express themselves very well. And the media, not all of the media is closed off to alternative and progressive points of view. We should be looking to exploit the areas of the media and phone-ins are a really obvious one. You know, Five Live, LBC, Talk Radio, get in there and, and change the conversation yourselves. I think that's a really great place to end, actually. It's a great, great thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you for being willing to come and thank you for your session.